everybody my name is najib sharif and uh, it's a great honor for me to talk to professor p s rao and many people know him he was a retired faculty at iit madras he was the head of department of civil engineering he held lot of administrative positions in the institute and he was uh, instrumental in building the laboratories at iit madras the structural engineering laboratory was built by him and he is uh, the founding members of the institute if i can put it that way he has served for almost 30 years in this uh, institute and held various uh, administrative positions so today we will have professor p s rao talking about his journey about his life and the whole story about it so professor p s rao uh, i would like to start from your childhood days so can you just tell us about how it all began so where did you do your schooling and what went on how did you choose civil engineering as your uh, btech degree so well, thank you uh, sharif for your kind words of introduction i had my schooling in a very small town called tune it's on the border between uh, two districts east godavari and visakhapatnam in andhra pradesh and uh, the type of education at that time was slightly different from what you have nowadays we had uh, schooling for uh, 11 years and it ends with uh, an examination called sslc secondary school leaving certificate and when i supposed to complete that at the age of 16 or 17 because when i supposed to start at uh, the age of 5 but i completed that when i was 13 and of years very very young age in, in tune standing first for the school then i went to the college in a bigger town called rajamandri in east godavari district the government arts college and at that time the state of uh, andhra pradesh did not exist it was a composite madras state and for the entire madras state there were only three or four government colleges one of them happened to be the rajamandri college the other one was at kumbakonam and it was quite difficult to get into that college also but because of the fact that i did well in the slc examination and i was the school first i could get into that uh, college for intermediate the pattern was at that time 11 years of schooling 2 years of intermediate and then uh, degree was for 2 years for bsc but for be it was 4 years so i went for uh, a 2 year course uh, intermediate course at uh, government arts college rajmandri which was the stepping stone for further professional studies later okay so after rajmandri then what happened well uh, at that time uh, also just as it is these days everybody wanted to become either a engineer or a doctor and uh, i wanted to become an engineer and unlike the situation in the present day civil engineering was the most preferred batch branch at that time nowadays suppose it's computer science but at that time civil engineering was the number one choice then mechanical engineering then electrical engineering computer science didn't exist at all uh, so that was the most preferred batch by branch by all the students and uh, i decided to go for civil engineering because i had also an aptitude uh, for uh, construction activities my father he was headmaster of a high school but he was very good at construction out of interest so maybe part of it rubbed on to me and i took civil engineering then of course comes the question to which college should you go IIT Kharagpur was started in 1951 i finished my intermediate in 1953 and many many people did not know about iit it was the only iit at that time but then the concept of iit was not known to many people there was the indian engineering college for example with about uh, 78 years of uh, history by that time itself rurki is a very well known uh, old institute shipur college of engineering these are the three oldest engineering colleges in india iit was very new but then people knew that it was an institute started uh, in collaboration with uh, international collaboration it was uh, an institute where uh, process from at least uh, eight or nine countries were participating through unesco 
So I, ch I wanted to go to that particular institute and luckily got selected. And when we, the first three, four batches, when we got selected for IITs, we didn't go through this uh, JE. Uh, we were interviewed by particular uh, selection committee. Each state had its own uh, interview board. And because of my good career, intermediate, I stood university first. So because of my good academic career, I could just walk into IIT Kharagpur in 1953, but the third batch. So civil engineering was an automatic choice for you because that was the most preferred engineering branch at that point in time. Exactly. Coupled with the interest my father created in me, although he was not an engineer, okay. but he used to take a lot of interest in engineering activities. Okay. And uh, you met Professor uh, P.C. Varghese there. Yes. So, can you I, share something about that? I will Your tell. I will tell you a few words about my stay at IIT Kharagpur. Uh, as I already told, uh, I belong to the third batch. First batch was in selected in 1951, uh, and it was a four-year course at that time. Professor Varghese joined that institute uh, around. Uh, uh, 56, 57, around 55, 56. But then he came already with uh, a good record as a, a very good practical engineer from Hirakud Dam. Prior to that, uh, he did his postgraduate studies in Harvard University. Uh, everybody knows about Harvard. And that too, under the father of uh, soil mechanics, Tadzaki. He didn't teach us in the third year or fourth year. In the undergraduate courses, I didn't have the benefit of his uh, lectures. But in, the, in between, he went to England, took a, a postgraduate uh, degree from Imperial College, London. And by the time he returned in 1957, I entered my MTech and I did my postgraduate under him. Then, my postgraduate uh, thesis under him. So after Kharagpur, you went straight to Germany or was, did you work Well, there was between? something that happened in between also. Immediately after I completed my B.Tech, 1957, I decided I would write the engineering ex services examination conducted in the, by the UPSC that selects people to IRSC, Indian Railway Service Engineers, Central PWD, then Military Engineering Service, about, about four or five central services together examination was conducted. So I wanted to take a chance and write that examination. Then two or three of my other classmates also joined me and we formed a group. The other person was Shankar Prasad. He was also a ranking student in civil engineering. Then one, Venkatramune. The three of us decided to stay back in the hostels after completing our BTEC and work in a very concentrated fashion, focused fashion for the examinations. So we prepared like that for three, or three months together, some sort of a combined study, wrote the examination sometime in August. The results came out the next year. And believe it or not, the three of us were in the top 10. I was the number one. My friend Shankar Prasad was number three and my friend Venkat Ramani was number seven. So that I would like to quote as an example to the present day generation, which is taking the coaching at various centers in competitive examinations. We didn't take any coaching. And it was the first attempt for all of us. Many people give, they spread the myth that you have to write two or three times before you succeed. But we attended, attempted for the first time one got these ranks of 1st, 3rd and 7th without any coaching. So I would like to tell the present generation that depend on your own caliber and build up your own method of studying rather than believing in coaching. Before so we... after that, there was a gap because once they announce the results, uh, there will be some time until you get the order. Yeah. So I joined MTech and then did my MTech course, finished my MTech then joined as a research scholar under Professor Varghese in a CSAR scheme which he got sanctioned at that time, a sponsored project at that time. Okay. Hmm. And then after Kharagpur, 
after you finished your masters you then wanted to go to germany for doing your doctoral studies that's right although i stood first in that examination i didn't take up that career uh, of uh, i just wanted to test myself and prove myself and, yeah. and okay. then after having proved myself uh, uh, i followed my my immediate passion of, of studying further and i chose germany because at that time or even before that german is known for germany is known for its uh, high level of scientific and technological development okay. particularly what they produced before the second world war during the second world war after the second world war so i wanted to go to germany so i, I started learning german even when i was in uh, iit kharagpur and when they called me for interview i could impress them with my german knowledge even before i went to germany okay so that was an additional point in addition to my good academic record that was an additional point which brought me this scholarship okay. is a dot scholarship german academic exchange service uh, i was there for 5 years in germany and there you worked with professor rush right and uh, i mean i would like to bring to the attention of all the audience that the work done by professor rao that time which was on developing the constitutive model for concrete is being used by you know several engineers across the world and it has been incorporated by several codes talk us through that and how do you feel when you know it's been implemented in the codes because that's the ultimate satisfaction for every researcher i'll tell you how it started um, i went to professor rosh after completing uh, my german language course in a small german village but i should say a couple of words about that german language course also it's conducted in an institute called goethe institute named after one of the famous poets of germany goethe and deliberately they are located in villages where the population doesn't speak any language except german and the german teachers in the institute also they know they are very good in english they are very good in french some foreign language they are experts but they never utter even a single word of uh, english or french or anything they keep on telling you in german and german and german if you don't understand again he repeats the instruction again in german only with different words says so that you get that feeling for the words yes. and when you go out and buy something in the market or something like that again you are forced to speak to german. speak german maybe initially naturally broken german but then it gets better and better yes. as you go by so i had undergone a course a two months course at that time then went in october 1959 to professor rush told him that uh, i would like to do a phd he said forget about phd i want to first of all know the candidate myself before i decide whether he is fit for phd or not so join in a research group which is uh, conducting an ongoing research project show me your interest and capability then we'll decide about it that's how i got into that group which is already working on the effect of sustained load on concrete okay so you generally the concrete is tested with a 2 minutes duration in a laboratory either on a cube or a cylinder but suppose you keep that load constant for a period of 5 minutes 10 minutes 1 hour or a few hours one or two days and so on with time the strength of the concrete decreases and that has to be taken into account in design of structures because all the structures are uh, permanently loaded yes. for a long period of time so that was being investigated uh, in depth and i joined that particular team and it was a big team of about four or five uh, engineers working on him because we had to take so many parameters into account the strength of concrete the age at which the concrete is to be loaded the rate at which the concrete is to be loaded There are so many various variables which are to be investigated. So there was a group uh, conducting experiments and getting the results, and there was a group which is taking the results and evaluating the results okay. to develop a theory out of that. And I belong to the second group. Okay. So one group was conducting tests. We took the results from them, and there was another senior colleague of mine by name Grasser. He also became a professor later, and myself and uh, Professor Grasser. formed the team which evaluated the results so we found that uh, 
whereas the strength decreases with time, but the deformations increase. So we have to combine the fall of uh, strength with the increase in deformation. We tried so many stress strain curves and finally arrived at uh, a particular stress strain stress block, a parabola plus rectangle, which gave the minimum strength taking all the parameters into account. And that's how the German government, has, uh, German industry has adopted that as a standard. Then France has adopted that as a standard. Then the entire Europe has adopted that as a standard. England has adopted that as a standard. And we copied from England in one of our earlier courses, the 1978 code, if I remember right. Yeah. And your PhD was on developing the constructive model, or was it something different? Well, I didn't, uh, I couldn't submit my PhD on that because it was a group work of about four or five engineers. And that is the practice in uh, German universities that, um, yes, somebody submits a thesis for PhD, but they would like to encourage a group work. At least three or four people work together, and maybe one of them takes one part of the experiment and develops a thesis on that. Another person takes another part of the work and develops a thesis on that. So I could not do that because it was a big group already. Then my Professor Roos suggested to me, after seeing the way I interpreted the results of the other group, said, why don't you take up your own uh, independent work? And uh, my dissertation topic was uh, on the stiffness of uh, reinforced concrete members after cracking. The tension stiffening effect. Tension stiffening effect, yes. And that has again become a standard, I'm happy to know, to tell you also, that it has become the standard method of calculating the tension stiffening effect according to the latest uh, euro, norms, euro norms. So I feel, feel very happy to know that my work found uh, use in, in not only in Germany, but in several countries for practical design of uh, structures. Yep. It formed the benchmark. Then tell us about this uh, story of the shells. You were so fascinated about shells and you had designed a lot of shell structures, roof structures in Germany. So how did all of that happen? Yes. Uh, shells started, uh, reinforced concrete shells started in Germany. Professor Dischinger was the person who built the initial shells. And Professor Roosh, under whom I worked, was a student of uh, Professor Dischinger. And his thesis was on shells when he graduated uh, in the 30s or 40s. He worked in South America, built a large number of shells, but gave up shells. He became a researcher on uh, basics of concrete once he became a professor. Um, but uh, shells, for example, were used in large measure for a uh, factory of Volkswagen in, um, in the northern part of Germany. Yes. Wolfsburg, I think, is the name of the city where Volkswagen had their uh, Factory. Professor uh, Roosh built those shells, those North Ledge shells. Okay. Uh, but then later on, uh, they lost in popularity because uh, as the time passed by, particularly after the Second World War, labor costs grew much faster than the material costs. Shells have the advantage that uh, the material consumption is very, very small. But the labor involved in making the necessary form work. Uh, is quite substantial. And with the change in the ratios of cost of labor versus cost of material, uh, the shells have gone into background nowadays. So after spending five years in Germany, you flew back to India and... No, you... I didn't fly back. I came by ship. You came by ship. Okay, so you sailed back to India. <laughs> there I would like to make this comment. I went by air, yeah. came by ship. I deliberately chose this ship because uh, I wanted to see Naples. Okay. There's a saying, see Naples and die. Okay. So there's a very famous city in uh, Italy. Yeah. In addition to that, I wanted to have the experience of traveling by ship, which I didn't have when I was going. So I deliberately took ship to come back. For two weeks, it took from Naples to, India. to, to Mumbai, Mumbai. So after five years, after spending five years in Germany, you came back to India. And who was the first person you met? I'm sure you did not go to Rajamandri. You went somewhere else? No, I did not go to George Munray. But before I tell you that experience, let me tell you what I did uh, in addition to my research work in uh, Germany. 
I told you already two important things, the stress, concrete stress block, one, then the tension okay. stiffening effect, the second. Those were the main activities for me. But in addition to being a researcher, I had a good exposure to industry. The contact between the industry and universities in Germany is uh, very, very strong. And they have a system called proof engineer, which means in literally translated checking engineer. So even if a god designs a structure, another god should check the design. And that's how Professor Roosh used to get a lot of designs for checking. And he, because of my, because of the confidence he had in me, along with Grasser, of course, he asked me also to help him in the checking the designs. And I did a lot of checking work for uh, Professor Roosh. And through that, uh, came in contact with a number of uh, firms uh, constructing buildings, bridges, and so on. And very monumental structures were uh, uh, constructed. One of them is a hangar for a uh, Lufthansa and also for the NATO military base at that time. With a column free area, imagine 150 meters by 60 meters. 150 meters, 60 meters, absolutely column free. So the two Boeing jets can get into the hangar simultaneously for repair. And this was a steel structure? That was a steel structure, of course. Yes. yes. After that, when I went to, went to, came to Mumbai, the two people whom I met at the Mumbai, Air, Mumbai port, because I came by ship, were my brother, who also graduated from IIT Kharagpur, two years younger to me, and uh, my brother-in-law who was in the railways at that time. But they came only to see me and take my luggage to Tuni, where my parents were. I came straight to Madras. After five years of stay in Germany, returning to India, I first came to IIT Madras from Bombay to attend an interview in civil engineering department. I landed on the 4th of June, and the interview was on the 8th of June. Just made it in time. And Professor Sian Gupta was the director, Professor Varghese was the head of the department and got selected as assistant professor and joined in October 1965 uh, as an assistant professor. So when you joined here as a professor, assistant professor, as an assistant professor. You, there was nothing, I mean, the, there was no laboratory at that time. Right. You had to build it from the scratch because the IIT itself was very new, IIT Madras was Well, I don't new. say I built it, but we built it, uh, yes. along with other colleagues also. So, uh. how much of German influence was there in, in the sense like your stay in Germany and your association with the professors there, and how much of it came down here, how much of it trickled down? Yes, there, there again I have to tell uh, a couple of stories. The civil engineering department was not included in the Indo-German agreement uh, when they set up this institute of uh, IIT, in the IIT Madras, but that reminds me my connection with IIT Madras started well before that, even when I was in IIT Kharagpur. The German delegation which came to India to study the existing IITs already by that time. There was uh, IIT Kharagpur, naturally. Then the second uh, IIT was Mumbai. The third was IIT Madras. So they wanted to study how IIT Kharagpur and IIT Mumbai were working. And that committee came to IIT Kharagpur in 1950. This institute was started in 59, 57. Okay. And I was a student at that time. I was in my Ajad Hall of Residence at IIT Kharagpur. We invited the German team for dinner on a Deepavali day. So the German team, which sanctioned this institute, we entertained them in our hostel at IIT Kharagpur two years prior to that on a Deepavali day. Yes. Coming back to IIT Madras, when civil engineering was uh, not included, Professor Varghese came down from IIT Kharagpur. He knew how valuable the foreign collaboration is from his uh, IIT Kharagpur days. Um, he somehow wanted to uh, get civil engineering also included in uh, the departments which are to be supported by Germany. And it came very handy to him that the leader of the German delegation, which was here in IIT Madras, looking after uh, 
the initial setting up of the institute, happened to be Professor Krauss, who was a professor at IIT Kharagpur. So Professor Varghese knew Professor Krauss from his Kharagpur days. And then after he took over as the head of the department in 62 uh, or 63, around that time, he approached Krauss, convinced Professor Krauss that uh, uh, civil engineering also should be included. Uh, and that's how he got civil engineering included. The reason why the Germans didn't include civil engineering in the initial list was they felt that uh, India was good enough in civil engineering even without foreign aid. But then that was correct. We had uh, wonderful uh, irrigation structures, uh, which were on par with uh, any structures anywhere in the world, irrigation structures. But urban infrastructure, uh, we were not on par with other countries. So I think Professor Varghis must have made that point to Professor Cross and got civil engineering included. And once he got civil engineering included in 63, 64, around that time, he started corresponding with me in Germany. Because he knew, I worked with Professor Varghis, went to Germany, so he knew that I was in Germany. Then he said, uh, why don't you ask your Professor Roosh to help us in setting up the laboratory. Then when I met Roosh, he was already 64 or 65. He said, Rao, I'm quite old. India is very far. We well, go to Professor Kordina, who was here in my laboratory and who has now become a professor at Braunschweig. And he will agree. So I, and he, I knew Professor Kordina because he was originally in Munich. He used to come very frequently. Then I wrote to Professor Kordina and talked to him. And he readily agreed. And then as a junior of his, Professor Eibel, he was also earlier in Munich laboratory. So those two formed a team, Professor Cordina and Professor Eibel. They came down here a number of times, helped us in preparing the layout for the laboratory, obtaining equipment uh, from the German companies. Uh, all that was done by the German team. In fact, the structural engineering laboratory which we have today is uh, more or less a replica of the Munich laboratory. Because I had training in Munich, Professor Kordina was a student of Professor Roosh earlier, much earlier. Professor Eibel also joined in Munich and then went to Professor Kordina. So all the three of us had that uh, Munich flavor with us. And we reproduced that here with a few modifications to suit Indian conditions. For example, the Munich laboratory would be having three office blocks on three sides of the laboratory. Here we have only on two sides. Two sides. That is to permit ventilation, yes. which is not necessary in Germany. Yes. So we made some alterations to suit Indian conditions. And that's how the Germans came into picture. First, Professor Varghese got the department included in the list. And then I played my part in identifying the experts. Okay. Who were the other faculty members who helped you in constructing this laboratory? Uh, this uh, Professor Cordina and Professor Eibel were primarily in Germany. They were coming only now and then and going back. But we had two faculty from Germany stationed at Madras, Professor Plain from Hanover and Dr. Cordes also from Hanover. So we had two Germans with us for about uh, two and a half years or three years. And they were the people who helped us in constructing that uh, strong floor, which is a unique feature of uh, uh, this laboratory, which makes it one of the best in the country even today. Yes. And the other uh, um, Indian colleagues, some of them were already there even before I joined. Uh, in fact, most of them were there even before he joined in 65. Professor Victor and Professor T.P. Ganeshan, Professor R. Radhakrishnan, Professor Raj Gopalan, Professor C.S. Krishnamurthy, all, all stalwarts in their own fields. Of course, they became stalwarts later, but at that time they were a young, young, young faculty. Uh, and I had the benefit of uh, their cooperation also. Yes. So while you were here, what were the courses you had taught to our students? Uh, I taught um, reinforced concrete um, for two years, uh, third year and fourth year. I taught priestess concrete. I taught design of shell structures. Um, tomorrow in the uh, function, I'll elaborate a little more when I talk about my relationship with Vosvargis. Uh, I would like to share some material away from you. <laughs> uh, so I taught shell structures. Uh, and then uh, I learned from Professor Varghis also the importance of conducting uh, courses for outside engineers, not only for uh, students in the campus. That's how we come, we come in contact with uh, practice. 
when you conduct a short course, say for about a week or 10 days or 15 days, engineers from industry come to you and they gain knowledge, no doubt, but they also come to know that, yes, here is a man, here is a person, or a woman, could be a lady also, here is a person who knows something more about uh, the subject to whom I could go and consult. And that's how we built up our consultancy activity. So I conducted a large number of uh, courses, short courses, for practicing engineers also. That's how I came in contact with engineers from LNT, from Doordarshan, from so many other departments. You mentioned about the consultancy activities. So some of them are remarkable and that we know. So, for example, the TV tower, the uh, Doordarshan TV towers, uh, radio towers, and the uh, tower at Rameshwaram, which is perhaps was the tallest still for a long time. And there was one in Bhuj, which uh, withstood the 2001 earthquake. So, tell us about that story, the journey about how you got involved in Indian projects. Uh, before I talk about towers, uh, I would like to go in the chronological order. Because the towers, I started working in uh, end of 70s and uh, the beginning of 80s. But before that, uh, when the laboratory was inaugurated in 1971, um, it was the only laboratory in India which had uh, a dynamic load testing facility. And the Indian Railways wanted to switch over to priestless concrete railway sleepers from wooden sleepers because they have the advantage. They are very heavy. So when you go in curves with the centrifugal force acting on it, the heavy track permits you to take the trains at a higher speeds. So they decided to go for precious concrete sleepers. But then the design, again, Germany was the leading country which was using precious concrete sleepers in Europe. So they wanted to copy the design, German designs, but the German companies were not that much willing to part with their uh, designs unless they are given the contract. So the Indian Railway started uh, to develop their own designs. And then when they came to know that uh, our laboratory had the dynamic load, that in the, in the railway track, uh, you keep getting the loads uh, as dynamic loads. Cyclic. One after the other, one wheel after the other. But they came to us and said, why don't you collaborate with us? And that's how Professor Varghi started the work and myself and my other colleagues continued it later. And it was a real big success. The precious concrete sleepers, uh, I don't want to go into technical details now because this is a general talk. The, the design which we developed and also the method of production which we developed uh, has been adopted by as many as 15, 20 companies in different parts of India. And um, now the sleepers are produced in millions, used in uh, Indian railways. So that was the very striking consultancy work we did in early 70s. It was the end of 70s and early 80s, yes, what you mentioned, the tall towers was the focal point for my activity. But there were others who were doing works on others. For example, Professor Victor was doing a lot of work on uh, bridges. Professor T.P. Ganeshan was uh, an expert in experimental stress analysis. Professor C.S. Krishnamurti was a, a top-notch specialist in uh, finite elements. So, and my group, myself and Professor Rajagopalan, Professor Arvindan, we were concentrating on sleepers initially and then came to the design of uh, tall towers. And when the tall towers were being built for the first time in India, the tall tower, we had uh, towers of the heights of 100 meters or 150 meters at the most as tall towers. But when I finished my consultancy work, we went up to 350 meter tall towers, which you mentioned in Bhuj, in Rameshwaram, and on Barmer, three or four other towers. There was no Indian code. There's not even an international code, except uh, beginnings were being made in America, and uh, an organization called CISIND in Europe is a consortium of uh, countries which came together to draw uh, standards for design of tall chimneys. Um, but then it, it was in the beginning stage. Uh, we had to build our own towers with uh, very scanty information. So we had to go through the practices in different countries and pick up the best. And we found that the Canadian code amongst the existing codes at that time was the best. Uh, he had a beautiful wind tunnel 
Professor Davenport in Canada, the largest wind tunnel at the time, now I do not know, uh, in the world. I went and visited that wind tunnel, borrowed the ideas from Canadian code, passed on that uh, information to practicing engineers through a short course conducted by me on design of tall tower structures. And then the people came to me, and once I knew that I had some information, they came to me for consultation. And um, the one big difference is such tall towers, we have to consider structural dynamics. Whereas small buildings of three stories, four stories, five stories of the order, you don't need to consider dynamics. It's all static load. But in a tall tower, when wind blows on the tower, then uh, there is a very flexible tower. It starts oscillating, and there is dynamic amplification of the load coming onto that. And the Canadian code uh, handled it very well. Now the present Indian code, for example, uh, uh, has taken good part of it again from the Canadian code, but enriched by our own studies in our, in our uh, laboratory also. Professor Devdas Menon did his work on that. Some of his contributions are now incorporated in uh, the present chimney code. And then during your consultancy activities, you also got in touch with uh, one of the greatest engineers the country has ever produced, Dr. Ramakrishna, who happens to be just on the other side of the bank, where you mentioned about Rajamundri, you were in Rajamundri, <laughs> he was in uh, Kovur. Kovur. So, Kovur. and it took so many years for you to meet, and then once once you met, there, there was a great partnership. You worked together with LNT on various projects and and uh, took the Indian infrastructure to a different level. That's right. I was born in Rajamundri, on the eastern bank of Godavari, and uh, he was born in Kovur on the western bank of Godavari, and the two are connected by a bridge the old railway bridge, uh, uh, but we met here only in, in, <laughs> in uh, IIT Madras. And he joined LNT already by that time, by the time. Um, and I still remember when I joined here, Ramakrishna was uh, a freshman in LNT, Dr. C. N. Srinivasan and uh, his own uh, uh, design company, design organization, C. N. R. and Sons. Then Then uh, a few others also. Um, we decided that uh, the engineers of our age group, uh, who were very, very active uh, in, this, in obtaining knowledge and also disseminating knowledge, we should form a group of uh, young engineers club. And we used to meet once in a month in the uh, residence of one of the members. We were about 10 or 15 uh, uh, engineers. Ramakrishna was one, I was one, Professor Purushottaman from Engineering College, Gindi. C.R. Naran Rao and C.N. Srinivasan, then uh, four or five others. Uh, we were uh, meeting, discussing the codal formulations, criticizing the code, and thinking of possible alternations we could suggest for code making authority, Indian Standards Institute. It was a very lively group uh, for about two years, but then each one of us became busier and busier. Then uh, the meeting became less Not frequent, continuous. less frequent, yeah. So but we, we still remain good friends. And, uh, so we spoke about your teaching activities here, we spoke about your consultancy. Let's talk about the research which you had done here and which shaped the codes in the country. There was, you had several students, you may number the number of PhDs you had produced and also the works which they had done. Yes, uh, my first PhD student was Dr. B. V. Subramanian, a brilliant candidate. Uh, he later on worked as a scientist in uh, SCRC. Then he became a consultant, engineer, consulting engineer by himself. Uh, it was on uh, the design of uh, statically indeterminate structures, concrete structures, using plastic hinge theory. That was a contribution which was adopted in some of the uh, codes. Then the formula for crack width calculations was another point of investigation, which again found application in some of the codes. Um, as I told you already, the uh, loadings, which are to be considered for design of tall towers, based on a very rational probabilistic consideration, we determined the criteria for that, which again are finding uh, place in the chimney code. So like that, there were many uh, instances where they had a direct impact on the industry. They, Sleeper production 
I, I already explained to you that the initial first sleepers were cast in our laboratory. Now they are manufactured in millions all over the country. Now we move to the other segment, which is the administrative work oh, which yes. you had <laughs> done for this institute, which has uh, helped institute the law in, in a big way. Uh, there are several positions you had you had held. If you can first tell about your uh, first position of responsibility, you know, when it started, probably the head of the laboratory or head of the... Well, I was the head of the laboratory. Professor Plain was the... Professor Varghese was the head of the laboratory, but he left in um, one year after the inauguration, 72 or so, 70 minutes was inaugurated. And uh, I was in Germany at that time. So I came back and became the head of the laboratory. For about 12 years, I was the head of the laboratory. Then we introduced the system of rotation. So every professor became a head once in three years, once in three years. But uh, after having been a head of the laboratory from 72 onwards, I became the head of the department in uh, uh, 77, end of 77. Then within one and a half years of my becoming the head of the department, Professor Indresen came over as the director. And uh, he wanted to make me the dean for consultancy because I was already active in consultancy. So I was there only for one and a half years as the head of the department and I became the dean for consultancy for two years. The job which I liked because I liked consultancy and uh, I did a fairly good job which was appreciated by my, my co colleagues also. But uh, after two years, uh, Professor Indresen had an idea that he would like to retain some of the, there were five deans. Three deans he would like to retain, the other two deans would retire. Then he would recruit uh, fresh two deans. And again, that sort of uh, partial replacement would be followed so that more number of people get exposed to administration in the end. So in that process, after finished my two years as a dean of consultancy, he asked me to take over as the, he asked me to continue, one of the persons to continue. And he asked me to take over as the dean of uh, academic affairs, which deals with examinations, uh, fixation of courses, looking after uh, uh, dropouts, uh, re-examinations, conducting grades, publishing grades, and things like that. I told Professor Indresen, sir, uh, uh, that is not my cup of tea. Uh, you gave me consultancy. I like that work. Uh, unfortunately, my colleagues also appreciated it. I'm happy about it. But this, I don't think I'll be able to do it. Uh, please leave me out. Then he asked me two questions, one after another. Uh, what do you want to do if you don't want to become a dean? I said, sir, uh, I've got my consultancy, I've got my research work, I've got my teaching, I like all of them. So I'll go back as a professor and uh, do all these works. Then he immediately shot a question at me. Do you mean to say, Professor Rao, that I should select as deans such people who do not have any work to do? And can you imagine, immediately they came the question, can you imagine how much harm such people can do to the system if I select such people as deans? <laughs> I didn't have answers <laughs> for those two questions. So I had to accept that dean of uh, academic affairs. And that was one of the bad first periods uh, for my stay as far as work is concerned. I, I did fairly well, but the amount of work I had to uh, undertake was tremendous those two years. We had to close the four-year, five-year program, BTEC program, and start the four-year program. And these students who were to pass out simultaneously with four-year four year batch and fifth-year batch, they came and told me, sir, we would like to go out after four and a half years. They had to run a four and a half year program, a four-year program, a five-year program. MTEC was to be changed from two years to one and a half years. We had to conduct the first gate examination, all came under my purview as a dean of uh, okay. academic affairs. And then introduced the credit system in the college, in the uh, institute. Until that time, credit system was not known. It was brought by Professor Indresen, but I had to implement that. So there was so much of work to be done at that time. But fortunately, I could uh, withstand all that pressure and, and uh, convince, uh, satisfy my other colleagues also about uh, the way things have to be done. But you were also the uh, the warden for some of the hostels. Well, that was much earlier. 
That was before I became uh, uh, even a professor, I think. Uh, I was only assistant professor at the time. So 69 to 72. At the time only I was the uh, faculty advisor to Campus Times, around that time, 67, 68. Uh, Dr. Ramchandran, he wanted me to become the campus advisor, uh, advisor, uh, faculty advisor for Campus Times. I was warden of Ramnada Hostel for three years, 69 to 72. At the end of the term only I became a professor. So, after, after uh, serving in this institute for 30 years, and then finally you had to say goodbye. But before you had to say this farewell, I want to ask you how was the campus back then? And how do you think, you know, because now since you have come here, what do you think has changed? And the department as well, the campus and the department. Well, the department uh, has become much, much bigger. I think we were only about uh, 30 faculty members, or even less than that, 25 to 30 faculty My understanding is as much as 50 to 60. The structural engineering laboratory, the PhD scholar strength is uh, quite large now. Uh, I think the department has, uh, I got into Mayor Prasad uh, when I talked to him some time back, had as many as 200 PhD students at a time. All, all, the, all uh, sections put together. It was unimaginable when we were uh, <laughs> on the faculty here. Um, I do not know about the teacher-student contact nowadays, but the teacher-student contact at that time used to be very, very close. In fact, uh, many of the MTech students, we used to involve them in our uh, consultancy projects. Uh, I don't know what they do right now. Maybe they're doing even now. Um, then uh, the one big difference I find from that time to this time is the increase in the faculty strength and the student strength. I don't know because of that, uh, the personal contacts have become less and it has become more mechanic mechanical. That's what I guess could be the difference now. So 20 years back, you left this campus. When? when? 20 years back? 20 then, years back, 20 yes. Years back, yes. So I'm right on that. Exactly. <laughs> 20 years back, you left this campus. Hmm. And uh, after that, what did you do? Well, it just so, so happened that uh, I retired uh, officially in November 96. And um, an educational society called Gayatri Vijaya Parishad in Visakhapatnam um, wanted to start an engineering college. And they knew me. Uh, they knew that I was retiring. And they started a college in December 96. I retired here in November 96. It was continued for two months as a, um, for extension here, to for seeing the MTech tour through, finishing their projects. And when they came to know that I was retiring, they invited me to go to them as the principal of the new college. So I became the principal of a new college. I was the principal for 10 years. And I'm glad to say that uh, it is ranked now as uh, one of the top most engineering colleges in Andhra Pradesh. You were a student of that college. So <laughs> I met Professor Piyas Rao in 2005 for the first time when he gave a, a talk for the Hindu summit, the technical summit. And that was the first time uh, I heard him speak about civil engineering and that was sufficient for me to get into civil engineering. <laughs> nice to I hear that. I would also like to ask you, this was, I mean, I should have asked you this earlier, but uh, when you were a faculty here, did you stay in the campus? And uh, where did you stay? Which quarter did you stay? And how, was the, how did you like the campus? I, this campus is one of the best in the world. Uh, no doubt about it. You can't get any such campus anywhere else in the world. I stayed uh, initially, or for a good part of the time, I stayed in that area near the temple. Initially in those multi-story blocks, uh, C1 type, I think they, they were being called C1 type. I don't know what they're called now, uh, in C116. I remember the number very well. Uh, as an assistant professor, I moved in there. Then when I became a warden, I took, I stayed in the warden's quarters for three years. From there, I came back to the so-called German quarters. That is the other side of the, the C, C1 block was on one side, and C block near the temple. Uh, they were all being referred at that time as German quarters, because the Germans 
participated in the design of the building, in the layout of the rooms. And uh, they were meant for, uh, at one time, there were as many as about 30 German faculty here. And all of them were staying there. So when, once they left, they naturally threw it open for uh, Indian faculty. And I stayed for 25 years in uh, one of those uh, uh, blocks, uh, C blocks, near temple, near temple. Third, third of road, third of road, yes. There are some stories. Professor Natarajan was my neighbor, was a next door neighbor at that time. There are some stories which go into every IIT, I believe, that whenever the civil engineering students see the uh, water tank, they say that there, there is no water in this tank. The reason being, when it was designed, they forgot to take the water load. How much of it is true? What I, I didn't get it. There no. are stories in almost every IIT mm. that whenever. Every IIT. Almost every IIT, mm. which I know, uh, where they have these water tanks, these huge water tanks, and the students claim that there is no water in the tank because it was not designed for that. They had when they designed, they forgot to add the water load. They had designed <laughs> for the sulfate. How much of it is true? No, I don't think it's true at all. I don't think it's true at all. There must be a joke going around. <laughs> Why, why, why are you asking that question? No, there must be something. No, this is behind. this is a, this has been a joke since many years, mm. and uh, mm. seniors pass it on to the juniors. <laughs> juniors pass it on to the next batch, and it goes on. Well, it could have happened once or twice. I, I I wouldn't be surprised. It could have happened once or twice, and in fact, that is what the job of this uh, proof engineer is. Uh, it's not the two into three is equal to six. Did he get that two into three is equal to six or five point nine? That doesn't matter much. Whether the, all the loads have been taken into account, which are supposed to be coming on the structure, you have to check the assumptions, you have to basic assumptions, the concepts, whether the structural system has been properly identified or not. That is more important than checking 2 into 3 is equal to 6, not that. So that is the concept. For example, if somebody has forgotten water load, then the checking engineer would have noticed it, that the water load was not taken into account. In fact, to my knowledge, uh, this concept of uh, proof engineer, I think so we are calling it as proof checking. I personally believe it came from the German word proof and means checking. Proof engineer. They are called checking engineers. And we will do proof checking for uh, printing and all that. That's not what is meant by it. We don't yeah. do checking printing. We do the correctness of the assumptions. And uh, as I told you, it was mandatory in Germany that A has to check even if B is a very great man, peaks calculations. But it was not there in England, it was not there in any other country, it was not in India at least. But once people like me, Ramakrishna, and a few others who got trained in Germany, Professor V.S. Raju, who came back, introduced the system of checking, it has become very common now. Oh. A few anecdotes which you can recollect. Can you share something with us? I want to narrate about another episode which happened around the middle of uh, 1987. It also happened to be the middle of the term of uh, Professor Ella Srinath as the director of uh, IT Madras. Around that time, Professor Srinath wanted to appoint a deputy director to help him. For that purpose, he sent out a circular to all the professors requesting each one of them to let him know whether he would like to be considered for the post of deputy director and if not, to recommend the name of another suitable candidate for the post. I replied stating that I was not interested but recommended the name of a very respected uh, professor of electrical engineering at that time. Other process would have replied in their own fashion. After about two to three months after the circular was issued, I got a call from the director's office stating that uh, the director wanted to see me. When I met Professor Srinath, he asked me, Professor Rao, you replied that uh, you would not be interested in the post of the deputy director, but all your colleagues want you to be the deputy director. Are you prepared to accept the offer if it is made? 
I replied to him stating that I was very happy to know that all my colleagues had such a good opinion about me. And further added that if the director feels I could be of some help to him, I'll certainly will accept that offer. He smiled and said he would consider that. For another two to three months thereafter, I had nothing. And in the meantime, I got an offer of a fellowship from the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation for a second visit to Germany. I left for the University of Karlsruhe. And after about two to three months, after I started working in the University of Karlsruhe, I got a letter from the director's office stating that somebody else was selected for the post of the deputy director. So I may not have got the post of the deputy director officially, but I was very happy to note that all my colleagues had such good opinion of me and they recommended my name to the deputy director. I am repeat I am narrating about this incident because it's 30 years since it happened. And at that time, and until now, nobody else except me, my wife, and the then director knew about it. The good impression my colleagues must have had of me must be due to the experience they had with me as dean for two terms under the directorship of uh, Professor Indrajan, the predecessor of Professor L.S. Srinath. So something which uh, hmm. has a remarkable place in the history in terms of engineering, which was you know done by your colleagues or uh, your friends in Germany, which is now not known to many people, but you know the background. You know, I, I have some anecdotes regarding my personal career here, but um, they may not be of interest to anybody. As, as a historian, they may not be of any interest to anybody. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the time. And uh, I would like to uh, conclude by saying that you have been an inspiration for several engineers. You have taught thousands of students in IITs and been an inspiration for several engineers across the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.